there. Is that uh, John speaking? Yeah. Hi, John. This is Jason Curtis uh, calling from South Africa. Hey, what's going on? Not too bad. Apologies for last week. Um, I have to admit, I I, I was uh, working and I fell asleep. <laughs> it's totally okay. And I woke up about three hours later going, oh my God, where am I? So <laughs> <laughs> but right on. That's, that's cool. But uh, is it going well with you? Yeah, it's going great. How are you guys? No, well, as I say, we I must admit very excited about uh, about your upcoming album, which uh, awesome. which I think is great. It's uh, uh, the the singles actually doing very very well at the moment on uh, on, our, on our nationwide pop station here That's called, great. called Five FM, which is good. Barney Simon. There you go. You know all about it. Yeah, right on. Yeah. That's awesome. And uh, yeah, so I mean, it's getting a lot of uh, daytime uh, play as well, and also on um, on our college stations as well, which is great because uh, the album is released in in January, I hear. Uh, yeah, in South Africa, it should be out in January. Okay, because it, it it has been released in the states already. It has not yet. Not. It'll be out in February in the States. Gee, okay. It came out in Japan. That's the only place it's out. There we go, yeah. That's right. It sold like 50,000 copies in Japan in two months. Jeez. And that's the only place it's been released. <laughs> we're, we're anxious to get it out, you know, in other places. Sure, sure. And have you have you traveled, uh, you know, uh, to to the Far East yet? To yeah, we got that? to play Japan. We played, uh, like, the Woodstock of Japan called the, the Fuji Rock Festival. Mm-hmm. We were over there for two weeks. We got to play with Rage Against the Machine and a bunch of huge bands, mm -hmm. you know, with Limp Bizkit, and we played in front of like 20,000 Japanese kids, and they all knew the songs, so Gee, it was great. It's scary, actually, it when you think experience. about it. So, totally. So, so, but now, um, you know, when I was actually just thinking about it, listening to the album earlier today, and I was thinking, you know, every band and every artist has got a story to tell about, you know, how they got their, you know, how they got their lucky break. Mm. Um, now, yours is sort of not too different in a lot of respects, but uh, what what about it sort of made it sort of a little unreal to you? Well, I mean, all of us in the band have been working our whole lives at this. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, T Tommy, the bass player, and I sort of knew each other the longest. He was actually my next door neighbor. Okay, that's going to be We started writing songs, you know, out of like like middle school mm. and high school mm. and uh, you know through a, through a mutual manager we met the other two guys in the band and we basically grew the band out of the recording studio we both had uh, I had like a home recording set up mm. and our guitar player had the same thing so we would start writing songs just demoing them at home mm. and we'd send these tapes back and forth to each other's houses and we'd add parts and pretty soon you know we had an album's worth of material written it happened really quickly, and uh, we hadn't really even played live mm -hmm. in a concert environment at that point. Mm -hmm. So once we realized, you know, that we had a bunch of good songs and everyone was excited about the songs, the four of us actually sat down together really for the first time and started playing these songs live. We only played about a dozen shows in Hollywood and Los Angeles before we got our record deal to Columbia. Right, right. Now that's, I mean, that's, yeah, I think that's every every musician's dream. I mean, oh I, think, God, yeah. I think getting a deal in L.A. Um, is, is certainly not the easiest thing to do. It but was insane for us. I mean, I mean, for a baby band that had really nothing going on mm. and then to play only, you know, 10 or 12 shows, it was just luck because one of this, uh, like one of these scouts, a guy named John Weakland from Columbia Records, right. just happened to be. He actually was at this club to see another band. Yeah, that was. And just, <laughs> and just caught like the the tail end of our show by chance. Right. And it was right after that show that he had called his, you know, upper executive guys, and you know, we started the deal. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it, I mean, when, when that happened, did you think to yourself? You know, yeah, sure. You know, this is something that uh, yeah, you know, too good to be true. Too good to be way. true. Yeah, 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 definitely. <laughs> and then the real trip, like the funny, the funny uh, story about how it's over now, mm -hmm. got on the radio here in in America, mm -hmm. is um, one of my buddies worked at a Lexus car dealership. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here in LA, I don't know if you've heard this story, but it's totally true. Mm -hmm. um, and we had just finished recording. It's over now. Yeah. With with Matt Serletic for the faculty soundtrack. Yes, that's right. And I had only one copy of this song, mm -hmm. you know, on CD, and I, I lent it to this friend of mine who worked at the Lexus car dealership. He had the only CD with him. Right. And in walks a guy named Kevin Weatherly, who's program director for, for K-Rock. Right. <laughs> which is like the, 
you know, the world famous K Rock in, L- in LA. And, uh, and by chance, you know, my guy saw his business card, saw that it said K Rock on there. Stuck it in the car. Said, said, hey man, let's go test drive this car, and is it okay if I play you my friend's song? Uh, no. And a week later, it's over now, was added to K Rock with like 20 spins in the first week. But now, that, at, at that point, had, uh, you know, um, did you know that it was going to be on, on the faculty soundtrack, or was it yeah, because we, of that? Yeah, re- we had recorded the one song just for the faculty soundtrack. Yeah. But it hadn't even been released yet. Yeah. And the rest of our album hadn't even been recorded. Stunning. So here we were, a brand new band, <laughs> and we had only recorded one song. Yeah. And we were sort of about ready to go into the studio to record the, you know, the, the other 12 songs for our album. But it hadn't even started yet. And then, by chance, it gets on K-Rock, and the whole time we're in the, the uh, recording studio trying to finish the rest of our record, yeah. it's over now, it's on the radio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and we're like, oh my God, we have to hurry up and finish this damn yeah. album, <laughs> you know? So you actually had sort of like sophomore pressure on your, you know, with your first song that you, that you wrote to be able it, to sort of make an was, album. It was like a crazy false start mm. because it, it's over now getting on K-Rock before our album was even finished was sure. like like a lot of pressure. Mm. So now that the album is finally finished, we're, we're all very proud of the record, very excited to get the rest of the songs out to everybody so they mm. can hear, you know, more more tunes just besides It's Over Now. I so. know 5FM is playing another track called Skyfall. And That's right. It's definitely cool, you know, to have the rest of our album being released. Yeah, and I mean, it's actually interesting that, I mean, as much as, you know, you've got the, uh, you know, the likes of K-Rock uh, playing, you know, having, you know, having supported you already, but um, then working, you know, from the Far East and then sort of picking up interest in South Africa. Uh, it, t- it ties the whole world up, man. It's, it's cool. weird, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so just LA, just, Tokyo, and South Africa. There we go. So Perfect. Johannesburg and Cape Town is playing your music, which... Uh, that's, that's amazing. Mm, mm. That is, that's amazing for us, seriously. We, we love you guys so much. We can't wait to come down to South Africa and play some shows. What are we gonna th- we gonna hold you to that? I think I think we're gonna plan something like in February, like right after the album gets released down there. Mm-hmm. I think we're planning to come down and play a bunch of shows and you know maybe a little tiny tour and mm-hmm. pair up with a South African band. Absolutely, because um, there's which yeah, would be great. Which I think is which is. I mean, that is happening more and more here, which is great as well, which is nice. But um, I just think, you know, for, you know, with with you guys, um, as I said, the, the traditional route for, I think, for, for any for any band is that, you know, that you, you build up this huge fan base over a period of, you know, months or even sometimes years. Right. Um, and your cycle's that much shorter to the point that, you know, were you, were you sort of a little concerned that perhaps everyone would sort of go, oh, this is wonderful and great now, and then sort of three months down the line go, okay, well, we had, let's move on to something different? No, absolutely. It's totally important to build that foundation with your fans. Um, we had a really good um, coming out of the gate, so to speak, on the Internet, and we had really had this, we used the Internet a lot to build a fan base. Mm. And we sent out, even before the album was finished, we started to send out, um, a little cassette sampler with just like two or three songs and we sent out thousands of these things mm. to, because we knew it was happening so quickly with the song on K-Rock we didn't want to overlook the fact that we needed that mm. sort of core like fan base mm, mm, mm. so you know to pay attention to that we sent out thousands of cassette samplers and used the internet a lot to to get you know word of mouth spreading mm, mm, mm. it's totally important to have that sure sure and otherwise I mean, the whole thing seems manufactured and it's not real so mm, mm. you know we, we have to keep some amount of street credibility otherwise it's a joke sure because i mean what are you guys doing now i mean in the states between now and and the album being released in the states are you, are you spending a lot of time on the road or are you supporting? all we do is play on the road mm. for for that very reason i mean neve has gone out basically the whole time since the record's been done mm. Um, just to get out there and meet the fans and play for people so that people can actually see we're a real band and not just a band with a song on the faculty soundtrack. Mm, 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 because everyone's we got that. To, we wanted people to see immediately that we weren't just this one song mm. on this soundtrack that came out by chance. And we've been playing and touring and touring and touring mm. just to get out there and connect and build that fan base like we were talking about. Mm, 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 mm. It's definitely starting to happen in America now. So. Mm, mm. Because I must admit, when I got the faculty soundtrack, um, y- your song was 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 
probably one of about two or three songs on there that actually stood out. Oh and, man, that, and, that's great. And I mean, that's a pleasure. And I actually landed up going back to Sony and saying, well, you know, where's the album? Because I mean, yeah. so, soundtracks always do that. You know, you pick up on new bands. And See, that's, that, that's exactly what happened for us. Mm. And we didn't want to get lost in the shuffle of the soundtrack. Mm. So we wanted to make sure we went out and played a lot of shows and did a lot of touring to connect with the, with the crowd and let them know that our album's coming out, mm. that thing, you know, the rest of the thing's going to get released. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, you've, I mean, you've done a lot of work in your, in your, in your studio yourself, as you said, in your, in your small studio at home. Now, what happens to that? Uh, is that a case of, well, um, you know, do you, do you put that on the back burner now until, uh, you know, and, and, and ride this wave, or do you still sort of dabble? dabble in your studio the songwriting process never really ends which I think is good even even when we're out on the road the guitar player and I will stumble on a new idea or something mm. and when we have a couple of days off in between tours we'll flip on our equipment here at home and just get the rough idea down on tape so we don't forget it mm. so it's not it's definitely the songwriting process keeps going Mm. And we're, we, we still demo songs from time to time in our little home studios just mm. to keep the momentum of, of creativity, you know. Mm-mm. So, so the album's not going to sort of uh, grow any bigger than it already is. Well, uh, <laughs> it did already by one song. <laughs> we we had to go back and add a song because we had written a new song mm. that caught the attention of everybody at Columbia Records, and they said, "Hey." Let's let's record this song for real and add it to the record. So mm. that happened once already. I don't know if it's a blessing or if it's just holding us back. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I'm sure by the time uh, the album's released, you're gonna. Yeah, I mean, you'll have like 20 songs. On. Yeah, oh, yeah. And, and, you'll, and you'll have 20 in your in your back pocket for the next album. <laughs> right. 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 I guess it's better to have too many songs than you know not have enough. Mm, mm. Now, I mean, your um, your sort of uh, influences. Um, you know, we're we're very British based. Or are yeah. very very British based. Um, Full on. <laughs> you know, but but any particular reason? I mean, because your sound um, is is a nice combination of you know of both sort yeah, of European totally. and American. But um, you know, your your music tastes being being English. What what is it about uh, you know what the English were doing that the Americans weren't doing right? Mm, you know, as a kid, you know, in in school, in grade school. Mm. My, my first rock star that I ever really like was hypnotized by was Robert Smith from The Cure. Okay. And, you know, you don't always admit that because it's not cool or whatever, but no, I, don't um, I don't know, something about The Cure, they, they became like my, the most like atmospheric influence in my growth as a songwriter. Mm. My, our guitar player in Neve um, grew up, who's, who's a little bit older than the rest of us, grew up on Aerosmith and ACDC and mm, mm. Van Halen and stuff like that. So mm. to fuse together like the Euro-British vibe that I was brought up on mm. and his American old school rock, you know, mm. guitar rock, mm. sort of like created created the vibe of Neve. Mm, mm, because, I mean, I think that that in a way I could, uh, you know, I could picture you in, in the studio, you know, uh, it, it could either be incredibly good or it could be incredibly frustrating for both of you. Right, well, it was frustrating at first to combine such disparate influences mm. and, you know, we would argue because, I don't know if you remember back in school, back in the 80s, if you were into, like, New Wave and there was someone else, they called them Heshers here in America, like mm. heavy metal kids. Mm, mm. They hated each other. Yeah, they did, but that was and, the thing. And you would never even think to get together and start a band with one of those guys, because you were like rivals. Absolutely, yeah, and you were so the credible ones. It, it was a really interesting um, synergy between the two of us when we, when we started, because it was difficult, and you know we got into arguments about stuff because I thought my stuff was cool, mm. and he thought his stuff was cool, and that was, you know what I mean. Mm. It took a while to develop, you know, some chemistry between us, and we basically had to throw out our egos completely, mm. and you know realize that maybe we can stumble on something that's kind of new with a different sound or whatever, mm. you know, even a little bit. Mm. And um, once we got past our you know, our egos and mm, stuff. The mm. marriage of those two sounds started to work for us. Mm, mm. I mean, did it, did it help that you had a producer um, sort of in there, you know, when you were recording the album that you, you had sort of someone that was sort of neutral? Um, Definitely. Mm. Um, the guy the guy that did the rest of our record, not It's Over Now, but mm. the whole rest of our album, named mm. Don Gilmore, mm. he produced um, Eve Six. Mm, and, and a new band called Lit. Yeah. And yeah. 
he was really, he seemed to understand both worlds. He seemed to understand my new wave side and my guitar player's American rock and roll side. Mm. And so he was a really good mediator to, to you know, control that. And yeah, it totally worked. I mean, I don't know what we would have done. I don't know how the record would have turned out if we didn't have Don Gilmore in there as the producer to sort of like make sense of our two sides. Mm -hmm. But now whose idea was it to use him? Um, the band basically decided on him. When Eve Six came out, we liked the sound of their record. Mm. Um, we wanted someone kind of up and coming. Mm. Um, we really believed in, I mean, we, we met with Don and knew that he was really true to his music. He, he got a, a demo tape of our stuff and seemed to have a pretty clean vision about how he wanted us to sound. Mm. And we liked, we, we basically liked the sounds and, and, and textures and stuff that he got on the Eve Six record. So mm. we basically just decided on him ourselves. Mm. And then, I mean, but when you go back to the demos that you did and then you listen to what, that, well, to the finished product. Definitely better. In what way? It, his stuff. Uh, I mean, I would have never said this myself years ago. People would always tell me that it, you can never really produce yourself. Yeah. And and I would be like, uh, you know, you you believe in yourself so much you don't buy into that. And you think, well, screw that. Of course you can produce yourself. You're the only one that really knows what you want it to sound like. Mm. But in retrospect, it really, you know, I understand why people would, you know, have been saying that to me for a long time. And to have Don Gilmore come in and get a whole different perspective on our, on our songs mm. brought them somewhere we might not necessarily would have been able to take them ourselves. Mm, 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 mm. So Don added a whole other element to our songs as a producer mm. that I don't think a songwriter is really capable of really knowing on his own. Mm. Sometimes it works. You know, you find songwriters or artists that are self-produced, so. and and sometimes it works great, but. There's, by taking that chance that you come into a, a producer who has newer ideas that you might not know about is a worthy chance to take sure. sometimes, I think. And sure. that's, that's what happened with us. Sure. And I mean, I'm, I'm sure, it'll, I mean, I'm, even even with, you know, with the likes of him, I mean, you'll get people now coming to you saying, well, I want to work on your next record based on, you know, what I've heard on the radio. Yeah, so definitely. It's going to become a going to become a, a, a bigger challenge for you over time as well, which I think is a, it's a great place to be. Yeah, it's cool. Mm -hmm, because it's a case of then you can, you know, then you could, um, I mean, would 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 you sort of give a track to somebody um, to actually, say, rework um, as a single um, and to see what they would come up with, you know, be it, you know, uh, someone just to, to mix a track or to, to do a remix of, of a track? They're talking about doing another mix of It's Over Now right now. Mm-hmm. Um, just to, just for kicks, because since the record got pushed back until the early part of next year now, we kind of have some time where we can take chances and experiment. So mm -hmm. we're definitely um, interested in giving, you know, like like this track, for example, to another mixer mm -hmm. and just seeing what he does with it. Because mm -hmm. maybe he'll come up with something that we wouldn't have thought of mm, another aspect to your sound yeah we love we love our record right now but uh, since we have the time mm. and since Columbia seems to be willing to you know use the resources on us we're sure. gonna we're gonna let um, someone else um Take mix a couple it. tracks just to see what comes of it mm, so you're not too precious about about that if it, if it comes back and it sucks, we'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I should give it to left field or someone like that, you know. Then, there you go. Then that way you can humor your, you know, your British side, you know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Great. Well, listen, uh, thank you so much. It's, it's, oh, been, thank you. it's been great chatting to you. And uh, uh, let this be the beginning of, uh, you know, of, of a great relationship with us. Don't, don't forget about us when, you know, when your album goes number one on the Billboard charts. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll be there, trust me. <laughs> great. Thank Sounds you guys good. so much. Yeah, and you have a good, uh, good afternoon. Thanks. Cheers then. Bye. Bye-bye.